How many, and this I want an answer, especially from confirmation students, old and new. How many Psalms are there? I have 150. I have a person I most most recently confirmed shrugging her shoulders. This is not good. 150. I got 151 over here. Do I got 152? 100, 151 going once? 100, wait, this isn't next Saturday yet. How many are in the R version of the Bible? 150. According to our version, if you look in your Bible later, if you go home and open your Bible, if you have your Bible right now, you open it up and look, the, the one's in there, but all of them aren't in there. So my wife is holding up the ELW. Um, yes, there are Psalms in ELW, but I don't think all of them are actually in there. So that's not a good thing to look at. But there's 150 Psalms in your Bible. There's 151 Psalms in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of of the Old Testament. There's actually 152 Psalms because if you've been in my office far enough, I have hanging on my wall the 152nd Psalm. It's actually a joke, but you can go look at it later if you want to. My office is open. It was written by my internship supervisor. It's a lament psalm about not having coffee. But I thought it was appropriate to hang on my office wall. There's 150 Psalms. And today's Psalm was Psalm what? Psalm 1. So it is the first psalm in all of 150 psalms. All right, we'll come back to that in just a moment. How many of you knew, and I say knew because you're going to know it here in a moment, even if you didn't know it before, there are how many sections to the Old Testament? Not how many books, because there's 39 books. Don't take my hand as being a... There's five sections to the Torah. There's five books in the Torah, which is one of the sections. Well, the prophets are all one. Prophets and writing and historical writings are all one. That's Nevim. And then there's Ketvim, which is writings. There's actually three sections in the, in the Old Testament. And they're actually ordered, if you look at a Jewish Bible... If you want to see one of these, I have one of these on my shelf in my office as well. The books are ordered in a different order than ours are. The Old Testament books and the books, our Old Testament books are the same books as you would find in a Jewish Bible. Correct? Yes. However, the Jews order their books differently than we do. For instance, the last book in our Old Testament is... Nope, that's the New Testament. It's Revelation. Malachi. The actual last book in the Jewish ver- the Jewish ordering of the Old Testament books is 2 Chronicles. It's the last book because it's the reader's... Second, first and Second Chronicles are basically the reader's digest version of the Old Testament. They tell you the stories across the Old Testament in a shortened form. They're expounded more in other books. But there's three sections to the Old Testament. And it's interesting to note that the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. And Torah means law, right? So law is one section of the Old Testament. The other two sections of the Old Testament, the Nevi'im and the Ketvi'im. The Ketvi'im starts with Psalm 1. And the Nevi'im starts with Joshua. Both of them talk about looking back to the law and focusing on the law and meditating on the law. God tells Joshua in Joshua, the first book of the Nevi'im, act in accordance with all of the law that my servant Moses commanded you. This book of the law, you shall meditate on it day and night, for then you shall make your way prosperous. And the first book of the Ketvi'im, Psalm 1 echoes what Joshua, the beginning of the Nevi'im, right? Nevi'im is prophets, Ketvi'im is writings. Maybe I should say that rather than because I'm confusing myself. We have law, prophets, and writings in the Old Testament. The prophets start with us pointing back to the law, which is Deuteronomy, basically, and all of the Torah. The Psalms then point us back again, right? Happy is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, right? 
Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither. Both of the other sections of the Old Testament point us back to the law. But what if it's not only pointing us back to the law? There's an interesting concept here that we that maybe we miss, right? Because Psalm 1 says, Happy are they who delight in the law of the Lord. Right? I had you all read all of Psalm 1 together this morning for a purpose. Right? Because this psalm actually is the basis of a song, which a lot of you probably know, but you probably don't have any idea it's the ba- that this psalm is the basis for that song. How many of you know the band Casting Crowns? couple. How many of you know the song Slow Fade? My family knows it because I've preached this sermon before, not here, but someplace else. Um, did you know that the song Slow Fade is based on someone? And it's actually quite quite obvious when you look at it, right? It says, and this is, this is my prop for this morning. It's like acting. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked. Or, our version says lingered. Another word you could use here is stood in the way of the sinners. Or sat on the seat of the scornful. Did you see what happened? You know the song, so you get, you get it. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor stood in the way of the sinners, nor sat in the seat of the scornful. This person started off walking, but who were they walking with? If you need a hint, look at your song. It's in your bulletin. Who were they? They were walking with the wicked. And then what did they do? They lingered or they stood. So they were walking. And then they stopped. And now they're standing still. And it's interesting that they're standing in the way of the sinners. What does that mean? Standing in the way of the sinners. How many of you ever heard um, someone say that I don't want to go to church because all they are there is hypocrites? They say one thing and they do another, right? How many of us have been, you know, we say one thing and we do another, right? That's what this is saying. Someone was walking in the counsel of God and then they started walking in the counsel of the wicked. They were getting their information or their their understanding. They were looking for advice from those who shouldn't be giving advice to this person. And then they stood with those people and they were standing in the way of those who were searching for God. And because they saw this man, they didn't want to look any further because of what he did in his life and then what he professed that he believed. And then he got so comfortable that he sat down in the seats with those who were there. He was comfortable enough to stay seated and to be there permanently. You see, this psalm is the first psalm of 150 and it leads us straight into the book of the Psalms and it tells us that we're supposed to meditate on God's Word day and night. Not only on God's Word, meaning all of the Bible, but meditate on this upcoming book all the rest of your life. If you've ever read through the book of Psalms and if you haven't, I challenge you to read through the book of Psalms. Read one a day. 119 is really long, so make sure you have that on a Saturday. (laughs) Or break that one up over a couple days. Um, But read the book of the Psalms. And when you read the book of Psalms, you'll notice that you'll read one, one day, and then you'll read the next one the next day, and you'll be like, didn't I just read this yesterday? And then you'll go back and look at the one you read yesterday, and you'll go, oh, no, wait, they're talking about the same stuff. The book of Psalms was not just arbitrarily thrown together. It was masterfully put together by someone. It was masterfully put together by God. And it's actually broken up into how many sections? Five. Which mimics the number of books in the Torah. Coincidence? I don't think so. 
But this psalm points us directly to what we need to do in order for our lives to be good. Right? And it's pretty simple information. Don't walk and get your counsel from those who you shouldn't be getting counsel from. And don't stand in the way of someone who's trying to search for God. Be a hope and a beacon, a light that's going to bring them into God. And don't sit down with the scornful unless you're going to sit there to learn who they are and to help them understand who they can be in Christ, not because you're comfortable sitting there. Right? Because where did Jesus go? Who did Jesus hang out with? The sinners. If Jesus was here today, we probably wouldn't welcome him. We probably wouldn't. We would. I think we would. But some churches wouldn't welcome him in. Welcome him in. Because... They wouldn't know who he was. And they would be ashamed to let him come into the... There's another really good song. It's called My Jesus. And it's not the My Jesus you think it is. It's by Todd Agner. You should look it up. If you want a copy of it, come find me later. I'll I'll play it for you. Um, Jesus is sending us out into the world to be a beacon of his hope. And that's exactly what that gospel lesson, which it looks like I'm trying to avoid, says. Right? Because I know Kurt caught it. I said at the end of it, the gospel of our Lord, right? This is the good news of Jesus Christ. If you don't hate your mother and your father, if you don't hate your children and even your own life and give away everything that you own, you can't be my disciple. The good news of Jesus Christ. Right? Is that good news? If you don't hate your mother and your father, what does it mean to hate a family member? I've had this conversation before about how could, how could anyone possibly ever hate a family member. And I can say that I have. I love my sister with all of my heart, with all of my soul. But there was a time that I hated her for the things that she did to my family. I love her today. Hear that and understand that. There was a point in time that Hate was probably too nice a word for how a lot of us in the family felt about her. The thing that we have to understand here is is that a lot of things get lost in translation because the word for hate in the Hebrew does not mean what we understand it to mean in English. Right? Hate in the Hebrew is more of a The Matthew's understanding, if you read Matthew's version of this passage, Matthew says, if you do not love me more than you love your mother and your father, than your sister and your children, than even your own life, then you cannot be my disciple. Hate and love me more. It's not about disliking. It's not about hate and our understanding of the word hate, because God would never tell us to hate anyone, but it's about proper placing and order of things. Right? We had a men's breakfast this past Tuesday and we talked about it. What is the marine motto? Semper, semper fidelia, right? Semper fi. But what is the, what do they, what do they, um, what's the three things? You say it? God country, core. God, country, core. In that order, God, country, core. Right? And that's what Jesus is saying to us here. Not God, country, core. But God comes before everything else. If you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow after me, you need to get your life in order and meditate on the Psalms and understand what's coming. And know my word and know my life and know what I'm sending you to do and have me first above everything else. And then everything else is going to fall into place. And that's what God is sending us to do. To follow after Him, to show His love to everyone that we know. So don't sit with the scornful unless you're trying to lead them to understand how much God loves them. And always show God's love in everything that you do.